Thank you uh, both for being here. This is our uh, Beck Lachlan First Amendment Center event, focusing on the president and the press and freedom of speech and a whole variety of issues. Uh, I'm Stephen Collis, the faculty director of the center. And I'm joined today by uh, professors Larissa Litsky and Ronell Anderson-Jones. Welcome to both of you. Thanks for being here. Hi, thanks. Thank you. Yeah, we're thrilled uh, to have you here. Just real quick, some preliminary matters. Uh, I'll encourage everyone participating to go ahead and use the Q&A to send in questions. We really do encourage questions. And this is supposed to be a very casual, free-flowing conversation, I hope. And so we will prioritize questions as they come in, especially from students. So send them in and I'll be monitoring that. Uh, the two of you don't need to worry about it. I'll keep an eye on it and I'll send questions your way when they come from students. We do have a lot of students who are interested in this who for various reasons had conflicts. And so we are recording this and this will be available uh, to them afterwards. I think they're especially interested in our kind of tag along conversation about uh, entering academia when you come from somewhere other than Harvard, Yale or Stanford. So I, I think that'll be a great conversation to have and I'm thrilled to talk about it with both of you. Um, let me just start off by introducing you both and, uh, and then we'll just jump right into the conversation. So maybe I'll start I'm going to start with the way you appear on my screen, which means Professor uh, Larissa, you'll be first. Um, Professor Larissa Litsky is Dean of the University of Missouri School of Law and the Judge C.A. Leedy Professor of Law. She focuses her research and teaching on the intersection of tort law and the First Amendment with an emphasis on free speech issues and social media. And last year, uh, she was named the Missouri Lawyers Media 2020 Woman of the Year based on her scholarship, passion for law, mentorship of students, and engagement of constituencies supporting the School of Law. She is a very prominent media law scholar and very significant for our purposes. She is the co-reporter on the Restatement of Defamation and Privacy, co-author of a leading media law casebook, a First Amendment casebook, and a reference book on press freedom, and she has published dozens of articles uh, in, the, in the country's leading law journals. She, uh, before she became a law professor, uh, Professor Litsky served as a clerk for the Honorable Joseph T. Sneed of the United States Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit. And I think most importantly for our purposes, she is a graduate of the University of Texas School of Law. So hook them horns, grateful to have you back, that's exciting. Um, professor Ronell Anderson-Jones, is the Lee E. Teitelbaum Endowed Professor of Law at the University of Utah uh, College of Law. And she's also an affiliated fellow at the Yale Law School Information Society. Um, she is a former newspaper reporter and editor and a First Amendment scholar who teaches researchers and writes on legal issues affecting the press on in the in, and on the intersection between media and the courts with a particular emphasis on the United States Supreme Court. Her scholarly work has appeared in numerous books and journals, including many of the nation's leading law reviews, such as the Northwestern Law Review, the Michigan Law Review, and the UCLA Law Review, and the Harvard Law Review Forum. She's also a regular public commentator on press freedom issues. Her op-eds have pu been published in several major news outlets, including CNN and the New York Times. And her research has been quoted in Newsweek, the Washington Post, the New York Times, and other national publications. She graduated first in her class from the Ohio State University School of Law and then clerked for the Honorable William A. Fletcher on the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. Following that, she clerked for uh, Justice Sandra Day O'Connor on the United States Supreme Court. She also worked for a time as a litigator working on major Supreme Court uh, cases and major constitutional cases. And just to show you how reasonable both Professor Jones and I are, by meeting together today. She's now at the University of Utah and I graduated from BYU. She graduated from the Ohio State and I graduated from Michigan. And so the mere fact that we are able to share company. Peace in our times. Yes, this is the lesson <laughs> for the society. So on that. Um, Kushner brokered this visit. Yeah. yeah right, right, right. right. <laughs> So on that note, uh, let's jump into the conversation here. Um, I'd, I'd love to, we'll, we'll talk first about various First Amendment issues, and then we'll pivot over to this question of entering academia. But first on the First Amendment issues, and, and uh, Professor Litsky, maybe we'll start with you, but I, I welcome you both just to go back and forth, and don't wait for me to shoot the ball over to the, someone else. If you want to just bounce off each other, that's wonderful. Um, one thing we talked about right out of the gate is we have some major defamation cases occurring 
in the country today. They've gotten a lot of media attention. People are aware of them. Uh, they relate to the election, among other things. I'd love it if you could maybe flesh out for us what some of these major defamation cases are, perhaps some of the issues they raise, including perhaps in some instances highlighting what might be flaws with our current defamation law. Uh, if you, I'll take it from there. So um, I just want to say to those of you who are thinking about a scholarly career, I picked an area that was quiescent, relatively quiescent. Defamation was quiescent for the first, oh, I don't know, 20 years of my career. And all of a sudden, uh, pretty much ever since I became a dean, defamation has just exploded and it's in the news every day and there's a new major suit every day, it seems like. And so I, I just read a headline uh, recently called The Golden Age of Defamation. So you probably know about the suit that, that came up this week, Dominion Voting uh, Systems, added to its list of uh, people that it's suing Fox News Corporation. And uh, so it has sued Fox News for $1.6 billion dollars it sued the CEO of MyPillow, Mike Lindell, for $1.3 billion. It sued Sidney Powell, it sued Rudy Giuliani, and doubtless there are more people to come. And the reason is that these are what Dominion has said are perpetrators of the big lie about election fraud, and specifically the lie that Dominion voting machines were flipping votes, and that Dominion voting had ties to Venezuela that were uh, illicit. And so uh, one of the interesting things about these suits, so first of all, they're brought by an incredible lawyer um, with, with a firm called Claire Locke. Uh, it's Tom Locke. So he is, he is just a really good uh, plaintiff side defamation lawyer. And uh, another interesting thing about these suits is the size of the complaints that are filed. So Smartmatic, the other voting company, had a 285 com page complaint and the Dominion voting complaints are all over 100 pages. I believe the one against Fox was 137 pages. And the reason is, that's kind of an unusual thing. So the reason is, is that the complaints are part of the campaign against disinformation. So the complaints are setting out the truth as these, these you know, companies believe it to be, and also the pervasiveness of the big lie and how it was perpetuated repeatedly, repeatedly, repeatedly after the people doing it should have known better, should have known the truth and should have stopped uh, at that point. So these, these complaints are masterworks. They also are written in a style with sound bites suitable for press releases, right? So they're trying to get picked up by the news media and, and get the news media calling experts to say, what do you think about these cases in order to get the, the company's message out? Because of course the lies about them were very, very damaging. If your business depends on having accurate machinery to count votes and you enter into multi-year, multi-million dollar contracts, based on the accuracy of your machinery to count votes, people running a, a pervasive lie that your machinery doesn't accurately count votes and it's being used to perpetuate a fraud is the essence of a defamatory statement. But it just is, these, these suits are a new um, component of a war against perceived disinformation. And so they're, they're gonna be really interesting to follow as they go forward. And uh, normally we think the big media players are capable of handling these big defamation suits. Uh, they have access to the finest lawyers, the finest defense, and the First Amendment law and the tort law are both um, highly, highly protective of the interest of big media defendants in defamation cases. However, these may put that to a test. Fox is only valued at $23 billion and this suit is seeking the extraordinary damages of uh, 1.6 billion. So we'll see how that plays out. Um, so yeah. can I ask a question on that? And, and maybe for both of you, uh, whichever one of you wants to field it, but it seems like most of these lawsuits you're talking about have a very 
partisan nature to them, right? We see some from the right against the left, uh, media that they perceive as being on the left. We see some from the left against media that, that is perceived to be on the right. Does that undermine the litigation's ability to somehow get the truth out there because everyone perceives it more as just one more aspect of a partisan battle in instead of a legitimate defamation suit and and what are the you know what are the normative consequences of that yeah i i mean i do think that we are at this very important historical moment for the confluence of um, uh, the problem of disinformation, uh, the, um, the issue of press partisanship, uh, and uh, the sort of role uh, of defamation law and constitutional protection uh, against suits in defamation law. And all of those things are coming to a head at this per at, at, at a unique moment, right? So we're at this uh, changed legal landscape and this changed media landscape in ways that are, um, I guess, undercutting the ability of folks like Larissa and me to make good predictions about um, what might happen next, but also um, shedding new light on the old world that Larissa and I used to talk to people about, right? If you had um, sort of brought us to talk about defamation suits against major broadcasters, say five or six years ago, um, we would have situated our conversation um, in the, the sort of background law of New York Times versus Sullivan, a major watershed case uh, that was decided um, at the height of the civil rights movement and that focused on uh, the sort of constitutionalization of American uh, defamation law, uh, sort of uh, emphasizing how critically important it is for robust conversation on matters of public concern for us to have um, uh, significant protection um, in these sorts of cases. That is um, that that sort of mere negligent error that might happen in um, the conveying of information on matters of public concern against um, uh, particularly uh, public figure defendants or public official defendants um, it was um, was something that we needed as a constitutional matter, and the the concern was that hefty damages against an entity like, in that case, the New York Times, um, might have a massive chilling effect on our capacity as a people to have conversations about really important matters, about our elected officials, about, uh, in that case, the civil rights movement and what was really going on in the Deep South. Uh, and we didn't want the sort of hovering threat of massive crippling damages against um, these news entities to be a, a real world probability in ways uh, that might make tort law um, something that could be weaponized to shut down conversation that really needed to happen. We fast forward um, to today's moment. And as Larissa has just described, we now see um, this real instinct and uh, uh, um, a, a real sense by a lot of folks that all of the other tools that folks have tried to use against disinformation seem to have fallen short, but that a, um, you know, a, a damages suit, a tort damages suit for billions with a B in damages um, might be the thing um, that would really uh, uh, have a, a significant impact. And um, all of those old concerns continue to exist, right? Um, that, that all of that um, framework considers to, continues to exist in the background, but layered onto it are all of the things that you're talking about. Um, the um, sort of uh, partisan nature of, um, the increasingly partisan nature of particularly some press entities, particularly in the cable news space, um, and the uh, partisan nature of defamation suits themselves, right? Uh, the, the use of, defam of defamation suits, uh, the wielding of defamation suits to make political points. Uh, all of those things are um, layering complexities onto our old Sullivan framework in ways that we're gonna really have to tussle with. So could one of you real quick, I know we've got a number of people in the audience who maybe don't understand how or why you mentioned this a little bit, uh, Ronell, but they don't understand how or why conversations around defamation are implicated by the First Amendment. So I'm asking you to go back to First Amendment Law 101 and just help some of our perhaps lay members in the audience or law students who have yet to take a First Amendment course understand, you know, when we think of defamation, we don't necessarily think of First Amendment, free speech, freedom of the press. And yet those are all intertwined now in our in our system. And I'm wondering if you could just maybe give us some of those basics real quick. I'd appreciate it. So so the uh, it, 
the tort of defamation is designed to safeguard reputation. And it requires that you have a defamatory communication, which is one that tends to harm reputation, that it identifies the plaintiff and that it's published to at least one third party. And then because that can be used so easily, that kind of lawsuit can be used so easily to silence one's legitimate critics on matters of public concern, the US Supreme Court has erected all of this First Amendment scaffolding that sets up First Amendment protections, but they depend how much protection uh, they, they put in place depends on the identity of the um, plaintiff. So if the plaintiff is a public official, uh, like a government official, we want the widest range of criticism about them and so if you publish something defamatory about a public official, they have to prove that you published it with knowing falsity, otherwise, which means you lied, or that you recklessly disregarded the truth of the statement. And so that's the rule for public officials. And the Supreme Court extended that rule also to what are known as public figures. So, you know, celebrities, house, people whose name is a household word. Then in the case of um, people who aren't public officials or public figures, but just happen to be involved in something important in the community, a matter of great public interest, um, they have to prove that whatever defamatory statement was made about them, uh, usually they prove that it was made with negligence or sometimes they can prove you know, more culpability in order to get more damages, but usually they have to prove at least negligence. Uh, in order to recover. And again, that's to safeguard, to make sure that we have the leeway to comment on matters of great public concern without fear of a defamation suit just utterly you know, destroying us or defamation being weaponized to silence public debate and public criticism. So uh, on that note, you guys are aware, I'm sure, of Judge Lawrence Silberman's opinion, recent dissent uh, from the DC Circuit, where he argued that he feels like New York Times versus Sullivan needs to be overruled. And he gives lots of arguments as to why. We do have a question in the Q&A wondering, what is the future of New York Times versus Sullivan? So would one of you like to, to feel that? Is, is, is anyone going to adopt uh, Judge Silberman's view? Now, of course, one of his arguments is he feels like most of the kind of traditional media outlets sway so far to the left that they are uh, affecting the public dialogue in such a negative way that the rule in New York Times versus Sullivan doesn't necessarily make sense. He even argues at one point that they're, they're using the power that that rule gives them and they're abusing it. They're abusing it to sway public discourse in one direction that is unhealthy. And he feels like more robust defamation suits might be able to correct that a little bit. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. And if you think the Supreme Court is going to do anything with that. Yeah. Um, so that question, uh, I'm just going to note, um, came from David Anderson, who is uh, who is an absolute hero of mine um, in this space. And so um, the notion that I am being asked to answer a question posed uh, um, by David Anderson in a First Amendment forum is itself right. We will mark this. Uh, we will go back in time um, uh, to young scholar Ronell, um, who will be um, touched and honored for the rest of her life uh, to have even gotten um to, to have uh, any kind of dialogue with David, um, who, whose work in this space, we should just note, um, is absolutely foundational, uh, really critically important in thinking about um, uh, the scope and contours of press freedom and the press clause. Um, and I think uh, the question is an incredibly good one, uh, both because of this new opinion um, from Judge Silverman, um, but also uh, prior to that, uh, because of uh, a noise made uh, by at least a couple of justices at the U.S. Supreme Court. Um, uh, just, uh, uh, Justice uh, Scalia, before his passing, um, uh, regularly publicly suggested that he thought um, New York Times versus Sullivan um, was a decision he uh, wouldn't have made and was inconsistent. He um, he pretty regularly suggested that it was because it was so such foundational law as a matter of stare decisis uh, that maybe it needed to continue to stand. He didn't actively advocate for its overturning, um, but um, criticized it uh, with some frequency. Uh, in a case a few years ago at the Supreme Court, um, there was a petition for writ of certiorari in a uh, case arising out of uh, a defamation suit 
involving um, uh, Bill Cosby and some of Bill Cosby's accusers in the Me Too movement. And um, uh, the, the court denied certiorari in that case, but in um, a comment that he wrote individually uh, in concurring um, to the um, rejection of uh, deciding not to take the case, a, a concurrence in denial of certiorari, uh, Justice Clarence Thomas um, wrote a fairly significant piece uh, describing his reasons for why, if the court had an opportunity to do so, um, he would um, he would prefer that the court unwind um, the doctrine that emerged out of New York Times versus Sullivan. Uh, for a number of years after that, and for a couple of years after that, uh, um, Thomas's view uh, had sort of been seen as a, a fringe outlier view. Um, but the Silberman opinion suggests that it is starting to take hold in at least some corners um, um, in uh, prominent courts other than the U U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, and it, you're right that it is rooted in a lot of the factors that you just described, um, that uh, uh, a piece of it is a concern about um, press trustworthiness and press partisanship, right? And so when the, the view of the, of the press by the public and the view of the press by the courts wanes, right? Then, then there's less appetite um, for that kind of um, broader protection for the press under um, Times versus Sullivan. Um, the Sullivan standard, the, the critique that is being offered is um, by at least in, in at least some quadrants, Justice Thomas's critique is um, heavily rooted in uh, what he thinks is a stronger originalist argument. Justice Thomas suggests that the founders themselves would not have approved of the constitutionalization of defamation law, uh, that they wouldn't have thought um, that in the way that um, um, Dean Lutzke um, so carefully described uh, that um, even though the law, the, even though tort law um, does in fact bring about a punishment for speech, uh, thus triggering the kind of constitutional protections that she described, uh, he, uh, he um, didn't, does not think that as an originalist matter, if we went back uh, and asked the founders whether they thought um, that there were First Amendment implications for imposing uh, civil liability for libel um, or slander, that they would have thought that there that, that um, those kinds of First Amendment constraints existed. Uh, and so, uh, largely as a um, as an originalist argument, uh, he suggests that we ought um, we ought not have that protection in place. Uh, it is hard to emphasize how critically important a foundational doctrine Sullivan is in this space. In the defamation space, um, it, is, uh, it is everything on which we have built our American system of, um, of protectiveness for, for free speech and free press and free expression um, in, the, in the space of um, having a robust dialogue about matters of public concern. That, um, as we said, the court in Sullivan really had a prime, uh, its primary concern wasn't so much um, about the press itself. It was about the conversation that the people were having about their elected officials. And if it were the case that you as an elected official um, plaintiff uh, could on a very minor error, right? Uh, whoever the speaker was, the press or otherwise. And it, the truth is that the, the speaker will often be the press, right? Cause they act as proxy for all of us and have these conversations in this space. But if you could bring a massive defamation suit um, with uh, huge um, staggering damages uh, to shut down uh, an uh, um, to get damages as a result of an inadvertent sort of negligent error, um, a, a mistake, uh, then people would, um, including the press, would shy away from coverage of that. They would be careful not to have conversations about uh, critiquing uh, public officials. And the court found that problematic as a First Amendment matter. Um, now, it happened that the court had this great vehicle. It was at this moment in the 1960s where the press was riding this wave of incredible popularity and huge levels of trust amongst both the public and um, the judiciary. Uh, that piece has changed. And we see that in the Silberman opinion and in um, in the Thomas views, um, but whether the underlying First Amendment concerns have changed, I, I think um, remains a question. Let me, I, I should now by all rights go to the first question, but let me add to the second question. So first off, our questioner could answer this question better than anyone I know and everything I know about the First Amendment and defamation, I learned at the feet of David Anderson and he has been my mentor, my friend, and my co-author for, and I'm going to get choked up, all of these years. 
And one of the things we're going to be talking later about how you get yourself into academia when you come, you know, not from a top, you know, Yale or Harvard. Well, the answer is you get yourself a David Anderson. And also I should add here, you get yourself a John Dzienkowski and you have them be tireless advocates for you at every turn of your career for the rest, for the rest of that career. And so, um, I, like I said, I, I'm going to get choked up because um, David has just been uh, amazing. But, but given that, given that he could answer this question far better than I can, I'm going to have a go at it. I wanted to add one thing to what Ronell said is um, the, the, one of the problems I personally see with the actual malice rule, and one of the things that perhaps is creating unrecognized pressure on it, is that it has never been adapted well to the problem of non-media defendants. So the actual malice rule, when you're talking about knowledge of falsity or reckless disregard, you're, the Supreme Court's examples of that have always looked at the news practices of professional journalists and said, did you rely on an unverified source? Well, the blogger in pajamas in the basement doesn't think about verification of sources and you know, one of the problems is increasingly neither do the professional journalist, journalist because the news business has absolutely been um, stripped systematically in the last 15 years or so of all of that depth of wisdom and depth of experience because reporters have been laid off in droves. And so the professionalism in the newsrooms generally, not, not across the board, but generally, if we're talking about newspapers in the aggregate, it's not there in the same way that it was. And so given that the rules are really tailored to, to uh, practices that a lot of the defendants now don't follow, and that some of them that should follow them aren't necessarily following, I think that's one of the things that's creating pressure and suggesting it's not really, um, it's not really as effective as it should. One of the problems I've written about is what about the delusional defendant who believes that something is true? They're, they're absolutely believe that what they're selling is the truth, but any reasonable person would know it's not. And so Mike Lindell, the CEO of MyPillow, who's been sued by Dominion Voting, he may be one of the people that falls into that category. A jury has already uh, forgiven the singer and celebrity Courtney Love basically on those grounds that, you know, it may have been a lie, but it's a lie she believed with all her heart. And so, um, I, you know, I, I really think New York Times is so foundational, it terrifies me as to what comes after because I care very much about uh, First Amendment freedom and press freedom from being uh, silenced through defamation lawsuits. Um, but, but I have some criticisms myself of the existing First Amendment scaffolding that surrounds the tort of defamation. So Ronell, let me ask you about that question, this idea of people who really believe, because I feel like in the world of uh, social media, my social media accounts are kind of weird. I've got a whole bunch of people who are on both the right and the left. The extremes of both groups tend to believe things that simply are not true. Uh, and they believe them because that's kind of the way social media works. It's really easy just to see memes and things pretty fast and adopt them and then just run with it without really doing any of your own fact checking. And as Professor Litsky points out, sometimes the media aren't really doing their own fact checking anymore either. And it becomes a real problem. How, how should defamation from a, as a, from a normative standpoint, what do you think? How should defamation law treat the, the person that's making these statements or publishing them who truly believes it's reality and that they have a duty to get it out there to the world? Yeah, I, um, so I think that this question taps into, really importantly taps in to those themes that Larissa started us off with at the beginning of the hour on uh, a sort of the, the role that defamation law does or could play on this new battlefront of disinformation, right? And it is made incredibly complicated by um, the changing media landscape and the changing partisan lands landscape uh, in which we really um, we really do not as an American society have a whole lot of shared truth anymore right uh, um, not just as to uh, right it has always been the case that we've been deeply divided as to right here are the facts and then we are deeply divided as to which policy solutions we should explore for those facts uh, but what's happened to us in the last 
uh, four or five years, right, has been that um, that partisanship uh, and information um, divide has moved down to the foundational level where we no longer have shared facts. And, um, and that um, sort of post-truthism world uh, that um, some of us in the uh, First Amendment space have been starting to write about and think about and assess the sort of real shift in audience, right? Um, that, that audiences, um, the, the kinds of audiences that are presumed in some of this case law from the United States Supreme Court might not actually reflect the reality of audience. Uh, you and I, as Stephen, might be the only people in the world with sort of truly purple um, social media feeds, but most people have uh, a very blue or a very red social media feed in which uh, they, uh, they live in a space that um, sort of compounds, algorithmically compounds their previous beliefs. And um, it, th things are taken as fact that are very different and on, um, on both sides of the spectrum. And um, constitutional law hasn't caught up with that and communications law hasn't caught up with that. And certainly um, uh, defamation law, particularly in this space uh, um, that Larissa has just highlighted, has not caught up with that. The question about, uh, we sort of presuppose that there would be a foundation of understood fact and that the, um, and um, defamation law and the First Amendment overlay of defamation law presupposed um, that uh, people who were engaged in um, readily um, identifiable um, falsehoods um, would be separatable <laughs> from people who weren't engaged in that. Um, and part of what Larissa is asking us to do is to think about whether we need to decouple that in some way, in part because the harm experienced on the other end of it, um, the harm experience, the, the harm that is being asserted, for example, by these companies that um, the, the voting machine companies, um, it, uh, that harm is consistent, um, whether the sort of um, obvious lie was perpetuated uh, by someone who earnestly believed it or by someone um, who um, lived in a world in which uh, their, inf their information world was such that um, they had um, a capacity not to believe it or had no capacity not to believe it. Uh, and we haven't, be be we haven't really tussled with that space in part because the, uh, the changing media landscape has only recently put us into this very algorithmically divided um, information flow world. And also because this uh, new media landscape puts us in a place where the rapid dissemination of these falsehoods, uh, the sort of virality of these falsehoods within those individual spaces um, is, uh, is so much more significant. And so uh, I think Larissa is absolutely right that this is a, um, this is a sort of um, modern defamation law, uh, modern constitutionalization of defamation law 2.0. Um, front and center requires us to deal with the questions that we didn't really deal with in the old era, in part because the factual dynamic didn't press us to do so. Steve, can I, David, one of David's questions was about uh, the Communications Decency Act, Section 230. And for those in the audience who don't know about CDA 230, uh, which has been in the news quite a bit lately, what this, the Communications Decency Act, Section 230 does is it says that if you are a platform, let's just take Facebook or Twitter, you're not responsible for users who post defamatory communications on Facebook or Twitter on your platform. And even if you know about them, even if you're notified that they're defamatory and don't take them down, you're still not responsible in defamation law for that content. And that distinguishes these platforms from traditional media actors. So if the New York Times uh, publishes an, an op-ed piece, or if they publish a letter to the editor, or if they quote a professor, then they're responsible as if they made the defamatory statement. I mean, they're protected by a host of other rules, but they're responsible as if they did it. Whereas platforms get a special immunity from defamation under this statute that came, came out in 1998. And that statute has received a lot of criticism because it allows platforms to be irresponsible. It was supposed to encourage responsibility by not imposing crippling liability on them when they made editorial decisions. So it was designed to protect good faith editorial decisions and especially to get porn off the internet because there was a moral panic about porn in the late 90s. 
Uh, but what it's ended up doing is protecting them if they do nothing. And um, one of the things that occurred to me during this discussion for the first time is when we were talking about New York Times versus Sullivan, and now we're talking about the Communications Decency Act, Section 230. Those are both examples of what is often called American exceptionalism in free speech law. So we are proud, or we have been proud in the past of being more protective than any other jurisdiction in the world of press rights and speech rights. And these are two examples of that. And we may be moving to the international norm. So the international norm on platform liability is, no, is liability based on notice and failure to take down. So if you're notified of defamatory content and then you do nothing, you can be responsible for that content in most of the world, but here you're not. And so there's so much criticism of CDA 230 that I worry it's going down. And then on the same token, New York Times versus Sullivan is exceptional in how much protection it gives to media defendants in defamation cases. And I wonder if we're gonna lower that to a more uh, international norm privilege of protecting fair comment. I don't know, I don't know. This, this discussion we're having today is the first time I realized that, that the fears that people had when they were writing in internet law in the late 90s about reducing to the norm, reducing protections to the norm, this is the first time it really occurred to me that's what's going on. So we did, So one of the things we had on our list pre-meeting uh, was just brought up in the Q&A and Bobby Chesney asks that when we talking about all these issues, I think it's related to incitement. And certainly we saw that with the storming of the Capitol, right? And so Bobby Chesney asks, bearing in mind the role that online incitement via social media has played in recent events, do you all think that the Brandenburg Doctrine will hold up? Or are we gonna see some changes given what happened uh, on January 6th. What are your thoughts on that? And by the way, this may need to be uh, potentially our last question because I do want to have plenty of time to talk about moving into uh, the academia. So what do you guys think about the Brandenburg Doctrine in light of recent events and social media's role in our kind of new media landscape? Yeah, for what it's worth, um, for um, a, a decade plus of teaching First Amendment at uh, major American law schools, um, when I tried to come up with a boundary pushing um, hypothetical to share with my students, um, so the, the incitement standard, just to sort of lay the, to give a, a two sentence um, foundation on it, uh, essentially tells us that um, our ordinary sort of free speech, uh, scope of free speech has some categories that are, um, that are uh, regulations that are technically government regulations of speech, but we won't count it as speech for purposes of the First Amendment. Um, and it, they are uh, categorically excluded. The government can regulate in those areas. And one of those is incitement to imminent lawless action. Uh, when um, uh, there is a statement that is made by someone uh, that is sort of a trigger to immediate um, uh, unlawful behavior by other people, um, it's likely to incite or produce that action, um, and it's um, designed to incite or produce such action. And for a very long time, uh, the wild hypothetical that I had come up with to share with my students was like, imagine, if you will, that there's this kind of crowd of people um, sort of uh, gathered together all worked up uh, politically and they're angry and maybe armed and um, they are outside uh, the White House or the Capitol and then someone yells something like let's get them or let's storm it or let's um, some sort of trigger behavior and then that storming of that government building takes place. Uh, and, uh, you know, early January of this year, I'm getting out my notes for my First Amendment seminar and sort of crossing off all of the imagine, if you will, parts um, to try to think in real world terms about the very hard question about um, the boundaries of incitement doctrine. We don't have great modern case law on incitement, and we don't have great modern case law that tells us per that particularly um, forces us to answer some of the really complex questions about the role of sort of prior communications um, that take place in a shared online space prior to the um, immediate uh, physical space uh, conversations that are happening in real time. The incitement doctrine has sort of very famously been, the boundary of it has been very famously strictly guarded by the Supreme Court on that imminence component, right? Um, we think as a sort of 
broad First Amendment marketplace of ideas theory that has long been uh, embraced by the court that um, if there's time in between someone sort of urging a particular illegal action and the taking place of that illegal action, if there's time in between there for the marketplace of ideas to work, for, for somebody else, some counter speech to happen and somebody else to say, actually, let's give some thought to this, or maybe we shouldn't overthrow this, or maybe we shouldn't take this violent action, or for that dialogue to happen, that we constitutionally rely on the marketplace to take care of that rather than giving um, the, the government the freedom to shut down that kind of speech or punish that kind of speech. Uh, the, um, the internet and social media um, and uh, uh, Twitter and text messaging, right, they all complicate that, um, that dynamic. We, we had some very, very early internet cases that, um, that involved things like, you know, posting um, wanted posters um, for, at people's houses um, and their addresses to suggest that they should be targeted, where uh, we thought a little bit about the imminence requirement in this um, new media landscape, but we have not done a good job uh, of really tussling with what incitement, um, what incitement doctrine looks like in um, the real world that we occupy and how um, the social media overlay plays into it. And um, my imagine, if you will, hypothetical is gonna become real world case, right? There will be real world dynamics in which um, scholars and commentators and judges potentially are having to play out uh, what uh, I think in the, the, the January 6th litigation um, and prosecutions are, are are going to have to think carefully about who was responsible for what, and particularly whose speech was responsible for what, and how we tackle that within um, a, 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 how we map that onto an old First Amendment framework in a very new reality. I just want to add one thing to that. So the First Amendment typically presumes that we're all rational actors and rational audiences, and the incitement doctrine only imposes liability in situations where there's kind of a cognitive hijacking, where the person in the audience is in such a, you know, an inflamed mob state where a mob mentality takes over and, and reason doesn't have time to take hold and prevail. And so one of the things that I think is super interesting about this, when we live in a post-truth world where we don't have shared facts to reason from, does that affect the doctrine and how inflamed people are at all times to be, you know, for the suggestion that they might go and, and do something violent? I think of incitement as having a, and my torts professor is here, but I think of it as almost like a proximate cause doctrine where the, like normally we think that criminal acts cut off the life the negligence liability. And so I think of incitement as being a super version of proximate cause cutting off liability because the person responsible is the person doing the violent acts normally and not the speaker. Well, thank you to both of you. We do have one question about 2.30 that I'm hoping maybe we can answer, brie answer briefly and then we can pivot over to the study or the conversation about entering academia. So this, this question asks, what is the liability uh, that internet providers could face for removing content if they do that? So the question recognizes there might be a problem from a defamation standpoint for leaving defamatory content up, but what liability might a provider like a Facebook or so on face if they take it down? Usually none. Usually the answer is none, and it has nothing to do with Section 230. It has to do with the fact that they're a private company um, taking down your speech. So if the government did that, maybe you would have a claim, but there's no constitutional claim if there's no state action. Your best hope is something like breach of contract, um, which the parlor, the, there's a suit testing this right now. The parlor was a platform for more right-wing speech and Amazon booted them off its, its servers. And so they're now suing, but they're not suing for violation of 230. They're not suing for defamation. Well, I think maybe they did throw a defamation claim in there, but the, the crux of their claim is a, um, is a breach of contract claim. 
Yeah, if your if your um, speech is removed by your platform, uh, um, the likelihood is that your beginning and ending point are the terms and conditions that you yourself clicked on, uh, probably without thinking about them, because you're like, this is Facebook, and everyone's on Facebook. And so I click it in uh, because I want to, I'll be a part of the community under whatever terms and conditions they set. Uh, but it is an internal Facebook governance question that you're dealing with, um, rather than uh, a wider question of Section 230. Great. Well, I, uh, I'm regretful we have to move on to a different topic because I could talk about this uh, for hours with both of you. But, but I do think there's a lot, I do know for a fact, there's a lot of people interested in the second part of our conversation. And uh, it's this idea of how do you enter into legal academia when you're not coming from what are perceived as the traditional schools? It tends to be Harvard, Yale, and Stanford, maybe Chicago, and then some other schools in the top, you know, 10 to 20 schools. And then after that, it's much more difficult to break in. Uh, a lot of people see this as an extreme negative. Uh, I don't know if you share that view or not, but I certainly would be curious if you could maybe just share briefly your own paths into academia, and then perhaps we could talk about some advice you might give to students at University of Texas. And quite frankly, we do have people from other universities who are interested in this and as well who are on now live, but who want to see the video later. So advice for others as well. So I'll start, whichever one of you would like to run with it, go for it. I, well, I can I can run with it. So so Ron and Ellen and I have known each other for a long time, and and we're good friends and co-authors. And um, I think both of us would say that it was highly highly implausible that we would wind up here. And I think I can speak for Ronell to say that we're both grateful every day that we are here. Um, so, I, you know, I grew up in an oil field town in West Texas. My parents were school teachers. And I went to Texas A&M undergrad. My parents said, you can't go out of state because we can't, even though you have scholarships, we can't afford the plane tickets to get you there and back. And um, in between uh, undergrad and law school, I went through undergrad in three years, um, very, very focused. I needed to save money. Uh, I had a Fulbright to study medieval legal history in between undergrad and law school. And that Fulbright changed my life because it made me know I wanted a career in academia. So I'm the rare person that walked into the University of Texas, where I also thanks to thank God to the Dean, Dean Mark Udoff gave me a full scholarship to law school that absolutely changed my life. But I walked in there and that's why I'm a Dean today so that I can help other students that way. But I walked into that law school knowing I wanted to be an academic. And as a result, I knew I had to have good grades. I, I tried to kill myself getting, a, getting good grades. Um, but I also tried to write during law school. So I published my law review note and I published another piece during law school. And I think that publication, and I wrote other pieces that didn't get published, but that were training for writing for publication. I was an articles editor. So I knew how, you know, what the range of articles looked like. I went and took good ones and I deconstructed them and I saw what purpose each, each segment was serving and thought, okay, I can, I can do that. I can do that. I'm a good writer. I can do that. Um, and that was really critical. And then I had mentors. I had people who supported me every step of the way. Again, without David Anderson's help and belief in me, without John Dzinkowski's help and belief in me and other people too, uh, you know, they, they weren't the only ones. I got to know all of my professors. That may be a small town thing. I, I knew them all. I was a pest. <laughs> I was a pain. David can attest. I was a pain. I was always on his doorstep uh, taking up his time. But all of that led me into, into academia. But the writing, 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 writing was key. I would advise somebody today, you might wanna think about a PhD, you might wanna think about a few years in a big firm, uh, but, but the writing, writing, writing is the, is the key to getting in your foot in the door. Yeah, and to, to, the, to your point about the PhD, there is some research showing that anymore, the vast majority of candidates have at least a JD and a post JD fellowship. And then on top of that, many of them also have a PhD. If you look at the Venn diagram, right? You're going to see all three of those things often, but at a minimum, it seems like there's a JD and a fellowship somewhere yep. to even be considered. Uh, and uh, Professor Jones, how about your experience? Yeah, I um, I, th I think that's right. I mean, uh, the truth is that um, 
uh, jobs in the legal academy are um, are hard to come by, and so it's like lightning striking um, for, for folks, e even from good schools, right, uh, to be able to work a trajectory that um, places you in that kind of opportunity. But it is also the case that um, there are, that Larissa and I are not entire outliers, right? That there are um, every generation of law professors, um, although for sure heavily weighted, right? Uh, they are for, it's for sure heavily populated uh, by folks from a very small number of top schools, in part because those schools um, groom people in that space and have um, networks in which uh, they, uh, so the kinds of support systems that Larissa described individually having are baked in at some of those other schools um, in ways that isn't, um, isn't necessarily true at every school. Uh, but they're, um, the, the kinds of opportunities that are available um, are uh, a sort of front end opportunities. There are lots of um, there are lots of CV lines that it turns out um, are really really appealing at the uh, at the academic stage. You've um, you've described some of them at the, um, that are obvious in terms of um, you know having great grades, um, so sort of stellar academic performance, having um, published well, uh, and increasingly um, having um, had a fellowship uh, um, or a PhD. Um, it is also the case uh, that um, top clerkships can be really great opportunities to segue into academia, uh, both because of the experience that they give um, and because of the connection that um, you get uh, to folks within um, the judiciary um, who can be um, additional great mentors, right, and advocates for you when you go on the market. <clears throat> um, so uh, uh, opening up the opportunity to have networks within that clerking community. Uh, both of the judges for whom I clerked um, have, you know, uh, uh, d dozens and dozens of other clerks, <laughs> many of whom are academics, right? Many of whom um, serve as um, um, uh, helpful members of a network to help other people who are looking um, for advice about the um, about the job market, the teach the teaching market, and so um, a, a clerkship can be a really helpful stepping stone to academia in that way. Um, not just uh, because it's sort of the flashy CV line that makes you appealing to hiring committees in the future, but because of the substantive benefits that come from it. Right, um, thinking at, having an appellate court clerkship um, helps train you to think and write like an academic and uh, the. the the, over, the overlap um, in the world of ideas is really significant and connects you to that group of people who can be helpful. Um, it was a really important, um, one of the uh, really important steps uh, in my path uh, to academia. What do you choose? So both of you have, have emphasized the importance of networking, which I, I think most people don't realize how important that is. Most young people don't realize how important that is no matter where you go in your career, networking matters. But uh, with academia especially, you know, I also can point to that, the, those, those professors who were big names in their field who just championed me on my entire path uh, to landing here and someone I can always bounce ideas off of and get their advice. And um, that is so crucial. But I'm wondering if you can give advice to someone who perhaps is at a law school where maybe if they don't feel that they have a professor there at their own law school that they can use for that, perhaps they don't have the subject matter expert or whatever it might be. Uh, is it is it feasible for students to connect with professors at other institutions and try to build those relationships so perhaps they can kind of build that connection remotely and then use that years down the road when they try to break into academia? Ab absolutely, you have to be bold. Uh, so when I was when I was in law school, I didn't realize you could just write an article and send it to somebody. Like I remember the first time that one of my um, fellow law professors told me, I mean, she was young, she was more junior than, than I at the time. She had just sent her article to the top name in the field. And I almost fell over. I'm like, how did you have the courage to do that? Oh my God. Um, so you can definitely do that. And some of them will help you. Some of them won't. Some of them will take the time. Some of them won't, but it can be absolutely critical to breaking in is to is to just reach out and find out who's helpful or, or explain your path. I mean, so for those of you out there, write to us. Sorry, Ronnell, I'm yes, no, yeah. the lower. Kristen knows that she has my proxy to offer up my assistance <laughs> to people who are coming up as First Amendment and media law scholars. She can use the royal we. It exists. Yeah. 
but but I'm I'm really proud when I can help somebody the way that I was helped. I I can I can never pay David Anderson back, but I can pay it forward, and I have tried to pay it forward over my whole career. So so please reach out. Yeah, just um, just to sort of highlight uh, what Larissa is saying. Very very early in my career, when I was at um, um, my fellowship, uh, right after I clerked at the court. I um, worked really, really hard to produce an empirical piece that was trying to replicate something that um, the absolutely like watershed foundational piece um, in the area had been written uh, by a guy named Vince Blasi, who's at Columbia, um, a generation earlier. And I was trying to track, track generational change in the press on this question. And I worked forever on this thing and um, spent a ton of time and energy um, and kicked this out. Um, and it got um, some good reception and it, um, and I think it was helpful and a, a decent piece. And five, six, 10 years later, I find myself at a conference um, with Vince Blasi. Uh, and we're talking about this and someone sort of referenced that piece. And he says to me, um, how come you never sent me that, right? How come you never sent me that piece when you were in the works on it? And um, I was sort of ashamed to say, like, I could not even fathom Like I could not fathom the possibility of me sort of broaching a conversation with Vince Blasi, right? Like Vince Blasi was not even a real human in my mind at the time. He was just some sort of like the like major uh, person in the field. Uh, David was that same person to me. I mean, wasn't that to Larissa? He was a real person because he was in the same space. But these were people who seemed um, so um, so sort of otherworldly important as scholars in the space that it didn't occur to me that um, that I would um, ha- that it would be okay for me to do this sort of thing. And the truth is, right, that Vince Blasi is the kindest, most generous, most sort of intellectually um, engaging, thoughtful, mentoring person on the planet. I mean, he's just a, a wonderful, wonderful um, scholar and mentor and a person who would have been really helpful to me um, had he been given the chance to do so. Uh, I get um, uh, a lot of outreach over the course of any given academic year. I field um, lots of emails um, from people who are in PhD programs or people who are in JD programs writing about media law topics, um, people um, who are first generation um, law students, right, who are thinking about this, who can see my own path um, um, sort of mirrors theirs and want some advice about that from schools that um, from people I don't know and, and from schools with which I have no affiliation. I'm always happy to respond to them. And the truth is, even if people, as Larissa says, don't respond to you, it um, it's not you're not crossing you know a, a, a violating any norm, right? Uh, they're not going. To, it's not going to doom you for your career for having reached out. It's a very common uh, practice, and so mustering the courage to do so and to make yourself engaged in the world of ideas early on, right, a a contributor to those conversations can be something that can really help pave the way for some great opportunities down the line. Yeah, you know, one thought I had was, Larissa, you said, they'll either help you or they won't. But what they're not going to do is actively hurt you, right? If anything, they're just going to be too busy to reply, and then you just won't get a response. That's probably the worst outcome, right? Well, and, and even, so there's somebody that's reached out to me, and I've got his piece. It's been sitting on my desk for two months, and it's been a crazy, crazy, crazy two months. And I wrote him back and said, I want to read this as soon as I can. And obviously I'm not reading it that quickly, but I'm now looking, I know his name. And because I feel such guilt that I haven't gotten it done yet, I am looking at everything he publishes. He has another new article out. I am watching his career like a hawk. I've half read it, but I feel like I can't respond back to him until I have something more intelligent to say. But so there's definitely no harm I'm now watching everything this young scholar does. Right. And then we'll cite him. The next time I have an article, I'm definitely going to cite him. Well, on the note of how busy uh, you both are, I think it's time to wrap up. I really, really appreciate you joining us today. I know this has been uh, super fascinating for me. I'm sure it's the same for those who are able to watch. And we will, um, we will post this video on the First Amendment Center's website and our YouTube channel. Uh, I, and that way people can who weren't able to join us live can hear it and hopefully learn from it. Thank you both for coming. It's really been just wonderful. Thanks for inviting me. All right. Take care. Bye-bye.